Namaste. Welcome to present operation videos webinar on getting the basics right about the third COVID-19 search. As per the Ministry of Health website, there are more than 15 lakh active COVID cases in the country now. Experts are saying is facing a third surge of COVID-19. And this coincides with, with the finding of a new variant of concern called Omicron. Uh, vaccinations have gone up about 167 crores, and vaccination um, for youngsters aged between 15 to 18 years have started, and also precaution for and those with comorbidities. Yet, COVID is not over. Clearly, COVID is not over, and for that, we need to take all precautions to, to stay safe. And for that, we need the right information from the right people. Yes, we have to, uh, we have to get the right information from experts, that is scientists and medical practitioners who are dealing with the virus and the disease right from the start of the pandemic. So with this purpose of empowering pub the general public with uh, the right information about the third surge of COVID-19, uh, the Press Information Bureau and the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting, Government of India, has today organized this webinar. We have two expert speakers who are highly respected personalities in their fields of work. Our first speaker for today is Dr. Priya Abraham, Director of National Institute of Virology at Pune. And our second speaker is reputed uh, gastroenterologist, uh, Dr. Rajiv Jaydevan. Professor Priya Abraham is an alumna from the Christian Medical College at Bellore. She completed her MBBS, MD, and PhD from this institution, where she was head of the department. And um, she, uh, she is uh, reputed for her works on hepatitis viruses and human papilloma viruses. For her works in, in this field um, of in this field of research, <clears throat> she has received funding from Department of Biotechnology, ICMR, NIH, World Health Organization, and the Population Council. She has been invited to serve as a WHO Guidelines Development Group member for hepatitis and HIV screening and treatment. She has also served as a WHO consultant to Myanmar and Sri Lanka in the similar field. She has also served on national committees such as the Technical Advisory Group on National Surveillance of Viral Hepatitis, National Assessor for HIV Testing, organized by CDC, National AIDS Control Organization, ICMR Scientific Advisory Committee member for ICMR NICET Kolkata, and she was also a part of a Department of Biotechnology Task Force for Human Papilloma Virus Infections. Besides, Professor Abraham has 173 peer-reviewed national and international publications to her credit and four book chapters. Professor Abraham took over as the director and scientist chief of ICMR, National Institute of Virology, Pune, in late, late 2019, when COVID was just starting all over the world. Soon after joining, Professor Abraham found herself leading ICMR NIV through this pandemic, where her institute has played one of the most pivotal roles in the country. Garnering the skills of a scientist, she and the team were able to report many firsts in case of COVID in India. First cases of SARS-CoV-2 in India, first electron micrograph, first whole genome sequences, first virus isolation, first indigenous ELISA, the first indigenous vaccine in partnership with the Bharat Biotech India Limited, and the report of the first variant of concern in India. She and her team continued to isolate and study the subsequent variants of the virus, including the latest variant of concern, Omicron. More recently, she's also serving as the director in charge of ICMR National AIDS Research Institute. Speaking of Dr. Rajiv Jayadevan, he's the vice chairman, Kerala State of Indian Medical Association Research Cell. He's also a member of the National Task Force of IMA for Coronavirus Pandemic. Dr. Jayadevan is also an alumnus of Christian Medical College, Velour, having completed his MBBS and MD General Medicine from this institute before going 
to overseas for further studies. Dr. Jayadevan is a gastroenterologist, a grassroots level social worker, public educator, researcher, mentor, writer, author, and speaker. In his spare time, he volunteers to teach in schools on assorted health topics, directly interacting with students of all ages. He writes on complex health matters and regularly appears on TV and radio. He has written detailed analytical articles on over 70 assorted health-related topics. He has a publication to his credit. His book, Think Like a Doctor, was released two years ago. During the pandemic, he has written several articles for doctors, policymakers, and the general public, and has taken an active role in educating the public on the pa pandemic. He was the first to publish on doctors' deaths due to COVID in India, and later published on the safety profile of vaccination as well, which reduced, which helped to reduce public anxiety about COVID-19 vaccines. He has personally trained over 5,000 school principals on the scientific measures required to handle the pandemic. Now, I would request the Director General of Ministry of Information and Broadcasting, West Zone, Sri Manish Desai, to deliver the opening remarks and set the tone for the webinar. Namaskar. Suchana Evam Prasaranan Mantralai Ke Patta Suchana Karele Mumbai or Panji Ghatko Dwara आयोजित इस वेबिनार में मैं पश्चिम क्षेत्र के महानिदेशक के रूप में फिर से आप सभी का हार्दिक स्वागत करता हूं आज हमारे साथ जुड़े डॉक्टर प्रिया अब्राहम डायरेक्टर नेशनल इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ वायरोलॉजी पुणे और डॉक्टर राजीव जयदेवा इनका भी मैं हार्दिक स्वागत करता हूं एज श्रीयंका जस्ट मेंशनड बोथ ऑफ देम हैव बीन द past students of Christian Medical College, Velour, which is one of the foremost and reputed medical education institutions in India. Today, we are in the midst of a COVID-19 third wave, primarily triggered by the Omicron variant. But when we glance at the news headlines, two things become clear. That the spread of Omicron infection has been quick, far and wide, often affecting all family members together. It's something like ordering a family pack. And secondly, infection, however, has remained mild and there are far less cases of hospitalization compared to the deadly second wave. Across the world, we are also now hearing about the number of cases declining, particularly in countries like United States and United Kingdom. In South Africa, where it all began, this country has seen the steepest decline in the number of cases in the previous two weeks. And even in India, we have begun to witness a declining trend. You may all well remember that during the second wave, Maharashtra was the most worst affected state in the country. It contributed the highest number of cases as well as highest number of deaths. But today, the number of active cases in Maharashtra at 1.77 lakhs, as per the latest dashboard figures of the Ministry of Health and Welfare, Family Welfare, it is less than that in Kerala, Tamil Nadu, and Karnataka. One may turn back and say, the reduction in numbers may be because a large number of cases are not being reported on. Perhaps that people knowingly or unknowingly have begun to treat COVID-19 as yet another viral infection. Okay, while some or many people may have refrained from reporting the cases, we still have another indicator that is the test positivity rate, which helps us understand whether the infection is ebbing or not. This is exactly like how a per capita income helps us determine the well-being of a state or a country rather than the GDP figure. Even there, today Mumbai's test, test positivity rate has come below 5%. Similarly, Delhi, another state, worst affected state, or a, or a city you may call, has also witnessed a similar trend. Pune and Nagpur, the other two major cities of Maharashtra, had been reporting more than 40% test positivity rate just about 10 days ago. 
but now even there the test positivity rate has come down below 40 around 37 35 and 37 percent etc so overall we have been seeing a kind of a declining trend in the number of covid cases two days ago a special report was released by the sbi research it says that india has been able to save or prevent nearly 93000 deaths during the third wave and this is all thanks to its massive vaccination drive as you may know and just now shriyanka also mentioned that india has administered more than 167 crore doses of vaccines to its citizens nearly 75% of all eligible adult population in india today stands fully vaccinated and uh, we have been lucky that we do not have anti vaccine advocacy groups in india as strong as they are there in the united states there are some groups are there but then they are not as strong as we find them in the western world and india has already already begun vaccination of its young adults that is 15 to 18 years and two thirds of youth have already been vaccinated with one dose overall it is now being acknowledged that india has managed to fight the third wave of covid-19 quite well but now i would like to briefly mention about how the center and the state governments have gone about fighting the covid-19 pandemic as you all know in india the covid-19 pandemic is being dealt under two acts that is one the national disaster management act and the other one is the epidemic diseases act the public health institutions across india have taken the lead in fighting the pandemic their efforts were later supplemented by the private sector initiatives also that also must be acknowledged since it has been empirically evidenced that different parts of the country witness peaks at different times the center has now adopted a fairly decentralized approach to fighting the pandemic it has held regular review meetings often with special focus on most covid affected states and issued appropriate guidelines from time to time the ministry of health and family welfare and its constituent organizations have played a very crucial role in capacity building and sharing expert knowledge with all the states not only that it is not that center is just giving directions it's also learning from the states the center has played a role of a catalyst and it has shared the best practices of one state with other states to adopt you all may be knowing about the large number of webinars that have been conducted and virtual workshops that have been conducted for health workers covering many aspects of clinical management of various stages of covid-19 in fact uh, covid has taught us new things all digital and the aims telemedicine youtube channel has now become a useful repository of all such content and another initiative the e sanjeevini opd telemedicine portal where patients can seek direct consultation online has also become a big hit as per the last count nearly 2 and a half crore teleconsultations have taken place on this portal while the health and family welfare ministry has been the nodal ministry for fighting covid 19 the ministry of information and broadcasting is tasked with playing the role of communicator of the government policies guidelines advices to the general public etc that is done through press and now we also do it directly using the social media platforms it is here in which the organizations like mine like the press information bureau the bureau of outreach communication all, all india radio doordarshan all of them have played role together and all these activities have been carried in close coordination with state government machinery particularly the iec divisions that is the information education and communication divisions of the state health departments and we have been able to reach the audience in the language of their choice in the remotest corners of the country and the underlying messaging strategy has always been now caution without creating panic panic and this has actually helped now the big question comes 
against the backdrop of all these positive aspects should we now become complacent about covid 19 should we start treating it as another endemic just like uh, another viral flu as i mentioned earlier has the time come to lower our guard and go about our life in the business as usual before covid way these are basic questions today's webinar getting the basics right intends to answer and we have two experienced experts on the panel to tell us what kind of covid appropriate behavior we have to continue in order to keep ourselves our families and the society as a whole safe as a communicator it is not for me to speak much about the covid because we have got the health experts there to speak about it so i will stop here i would i am keen to know what the experts have to say and i'm sure you are also keen to know what the experts have to say thank you very much and thank you sriyanka thank you sir thank you for setting the tone of the webinar in such nice with such nice words explaining the purpose of the webinar now we have we will first show a video uh, which which uh, sort of sums up the existing situation of the third surge of covid-19 and also how to deal with it i have been so much how are you bhai are bhai bina mask ke baithe ho mask are bhai yahan to sab apne hi log hain koi bimar nahi hai वैसे भी कोरोना तो खत्म हुआ <laughs> वैसे भी कोरोना तो खत्म हुआ <laughs> कोरोना संक्रमण अभी खत्म नहीं हुआ जरा सोचिए कहीं हमारी लापरवाही हम पर और हमारे अपनों पर भारी ना पड़े कोरोना अनुकूल व्यवहारों का पालन करें और जल्द से जल्द टीका लगवाकर कोविड के खिलाफ देश की लड़ाई को सशक्त बनाए now it is time to hear about covid and the third surge from the experts so we will start the technical session now with the uh, question uh, with with the questions to be answered by the experts so our first question is to professor priya abraham professor abraham what is the difference between omicron and other variants of sars cov2 thank you uh, for having me on this program and uh, the omicron is the fifth of the variants of concern that this world has witnessed from the start of this pandemic we have had five major variants of concern and i will come to defining that in a bit uh, but they are alpha beta gamma delta and omicron brings in the most recent variant of concern that has uh, the world has witnessed it uh, in response to your question as to how it is different this particular variant of interest has a lot more mutations uh, over 50 different mutations in its genome which reflects in about uh, 30 amino acid changes in its spike protein the spike protein is the protein that actually attaches to the host cells uh, protein so that's a very critical protein and it's also the protein that is the component of many vaccines so it has at least 30 different amino acid changes there so compared to the previous variants of concern the past this is a lot more shall i say mutated if one would uh, call it okay thank you professor now i would like to ask dr jayadevan What are the symptomatic differences between COVID-19 patients in the third surge and the earlier cases? Third surge was primarily with the Delta variant, which uh, unfortunately caused a significant number of deaths all around the world, including in our country. Fortunately, with the Omicron variant, the impact has been less severe. now when i say less severe i mean across the board it does not necessarily mean less severe for an individual it is like saying the average age of a person in india is 29 that does not mean that everyone in india is 29 years old 
Likewise, when we say it was less severe, it means that among all the people that were infected, the number of people who developed severe lung problems, stroke or heart issues or died as a result was smaller. And what we also saw was a significant increase in the involvement or infection among younger people. And that is a trend we first noticed in South Africa, where the median age was two decades younger than the Delta wave. Now, we know that if the COVID pandemic affects a younger age group, the overall impact will be milder. We know that because, as you know, age is the strongest risk factor for severe disease. So back to Omicron, since it's affecting predominantly a younger uh, population, the impact has been milder. Uh, there are fewer people in the intensive care unit. There are fewer deaths which are directly as a result of the pandemic or the virus. There are fewer people on a ventilator. And the same trend has been seen not only in South Africa, but also in the United States and in Europe as well, where we have published information from. Specifically about the symptoms, younger people are tending to have a flu-like illness. Now, flu is not the same as common cold. Many people have a problem distinguish, distinguishing between flu and common cold. Flu is a fairly severe illness where you are incapacitated for a few days, you've got severe pain uh, in the joints, in the muscles, you feel weak, dehydrated, uh, unable to even get up sometimes. So that has been observed in the younger people who were previously healthy. Uh, in older individuals, uh, we have seen two issues. One, uh, the, their underlying conditions have occasionally been aggravated. And in a few select individuals, particularly those who were not vaccinated, this virus has taken lives as well. Uh, the common symptoms, as many people would know, are fever, uh, and also a sore throat, which can sometimes be painful, a hoarse voice, uh, predominantly upper respiratory symptoms, including uh, runny nose and sneezing. And in a few instances, it can go on to complications. Body pain has also been reported. And in young children, a small number are coming in with uh, what is called febrile seizures, which is commonly seen in any febrile condition. Any child with fever uh, is at a slight risk for a seizure. And uh, because a large number of children are involved, along with a large number of adults, we are seeing a little bit of that. But most children have just a two-day history of fever or none at all and quickly get better. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, let's know a little more about Omicron from uh, Professor Abraham. Professor, why Omicron is called a variant of concern? So, uh, as I had mentioned earlier, Omicron is the fifth of the recognized variants of concern. And uh, a variant of concern is a, a particular strain of the virus that has acquired certain mutations that could impact on any one of the following perhaps increased transmissibility, causing a change in the overall epidemiology of the virus and its disease. It could enhance the virulence of the disease caused by the virus, causing more serious presentation, clinical presentation, or it could impact on the diagnostics that are used to detect uh, this infection or on vaccine protection, or even on the therapeutics or the treatment that's being delivered for this infection. So in the case of Omicron, which uh, is the um, subject of our conversation, Omicron actually uh, happens to evade or dodge the immune response that is generated, um, uh, that can be put up by a person who has had previous infection or has been vaccinated. This is called immune evasion. It's dodging the antibodies that are there in somebody who is previously infected or vaccinated. Uh, though most of the time, as uh, Dr. Jayadevan had said, it causes luckily a mild disease, more of an upper respiratory disease. And because of its immune evasion or immune dodging, 
it also is associated with a higher transmissibility, which explains why in the recent few weeks, we have seen such a surge over our own in our own country and in several of the other countries because of its higher transmissibility and immune escape. Thank you. Uh, speaking of the surge, Professor, are we having two parallel surges, one of Omicron and the other of Delta going on now? Not now. Earlier we did have Delta and then Omicron coming into the picture. Uh, but now it is almost completely dominated by Omicron and its sublineages. It is not a single, uh, you know, unique strain. It has su uh, three sublineages of which two sublineages, you know, two cousins of the uh, Omicron strain are circulating in our country. Thank you. Uh, uh, we are also curious to know, are there other variants which is playing a role, possibly playing a role in the third surge? Really not now. As I just said, it is, you know, Omicron and Omicron all the way through now. Initially, yes, it was colored by the presence of Delta and its sublineages, but Omicron has almost come to rule the uh, you know, roost now. It is the predominant strain circulating in our country as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, what about the upcoming variants and how are they uh, expected to affect us in the future? And in this connection, uh, we would also like to know how well equipped are the Indian laboratories and research centers in identifying new variants? So, um, upcoming strains, it's like looking into a crystal ball. We really do not know uh, what is likely to come up. It all depends on the amount of spread. Uh, if there are emergent, uh, if there is an emergence of newer strains, their behavior, and that is anybody's guess. And uh, the important thing, while we still speak of Omicron as a milder infection as compared to Delta, any of the strains of this virus should be curtailed in its spread. The more the virus spreads to new individuals, the more it will try to adapt in that individual and undergo genetic change. So that's something we need to keep in mind. We are all aware that it has called, caused largely a milder infection, but it doesn't mean you know we should uh, we should completely let our guard down, as was earlier mentioned by uh, Mr. Desai, that we should not let our guard down. And it's for this very reason why, over this pandemic, what has really uh, really um, improved in terms of testing capacity in our country is. Uh, there are several, several hundreds of government laboratories as well as private laboratories that have developed capacity to do an RT-PCR. So most of the RT-PCRs we use are able to pick up this Omicron, number one. And as a watchdog for our nation, we have a consortium. It's called the INSACOG, the Indian SARS-CoV Genomic Surveillance Consortium, which is... Uh, you know, running a surveillance, uh, doing whole genome sequencing. That means you're looking at the whole length of the genome of this virus, uh, monitoring and surveilling whether there are new variants coming up on the horizon. So I think our labs and our um, uh, specialized institutes that can do the sequencing are very much equipped and ready to take on even a future challenge. Thank you, Professor. Now we would like to know from Dr. Jayadevan about the treatment protocols. So is the treatment protocol of Omicron different from that of Delta variant? And what is the duration of isolation period now? For Omicron, since most of the individuals are having a, uh, a, a, a less severe illness, most of, most of these people had, uh, can be treated at their own homes. So. What we do advocate is something called prompt self-isolation. The moment you detect symptoms which are like a common cold, like a runny nose or a fever, a bit of body pain, headache, etc., uh, and if others in your contact as well are having similar symptoms, it's very, very likely that you picked up Omicron. And rather than immediately rush to the lab for a test, we advocate 
early and prompt self-isolation because as Dr. Priya Abraham said, we need to stop the spread of this virus and rushing to the lab is not going to stop the spread of the virus. Keeping yourself away from other people for a few days is the best strategy. Now, so self-isolation is one. Testing is required in uh, on a prioritized basis, particularly for older individuals. And we will come to that at a later part of this talk. In terms of what to do at home, it is important, firstly, to understand that our body has the ability to fight off this infection in most instances. So in other words, there is no need for an obsession for pills or injections to get rid of this virus. I'm talking about mild cases that are in healthy individuals who are being treated at home. What we must pay attention to will be hydration, which means that we need to keep ourselves well hydrated, drink plenty of water, make some ORS, which is oral rehydration salt solution, which is easy to make because the body, when it goes through an infection, particularly something like COVID-19 at home, tends to get dehydrated, which means you get weaker, your muscle strength comes down, you feel so tired, you can't get out of bed. Sometimes uh, this itself may result in hospitalization. So early treatment of dehydration with plenty of fluids, you could have, um, you could make your own ORS at home. You don't have to buy packets, which may, may incur a cost. I'll tell you how to make it. Just take five cups of water, regular water, drinking water, add a pinch of salt. That is a half teaspoon, teaspoon, the smallest spoon, half of a small spoon of salt, and six level teaspoons of sugar. Mix it well, and you could use it for a day. So drinking oral rehydration when you're having high fever is a must because that will keep your strength up. It's like watering a plant which is wilting in the sun. So that's one. Second is if, is the fever is very high, you could take a paracetamol according to your body weight. For most adults, 650 milligrams will suffice. One or two tablets a day will suffice. No more than three, at the most four. The third is that it is better to stay away from all sorts of fancy treatments, which may be dished out in the name of treatment. Unless there is a specific indication uh, there is no need for antibiotics, including for things like clarithromycin or azithral, azithromycin in uh, mild cases. The doctor will tell if there is a bacterial infection. If there is a bacterial infection, yes, that's in a very tiny minority of individuals who will need an antibiotic. It is important to sleep well, stay away from scary news, try not to read scary articles about the illness while you're having it. Get a reasonable amount of good home-cooked food, uh, which is easy to digest, and listen to the doctor's instructions. Stay in touch with your healthcare provider. For somebody, it may be the ASHA worker, or it may be your uh, local uh, primary health center, your family doctor, or any, any practitioner that is in charge of your health. So those are things that anybody can do. Now, in terms of hospitalization, people who uh, need to go to hospital for more severe cases, uh, the treatment is largely the same as that of Delta. The only slight difference is in the use of an agent, which is called monoclonal antibody. Now, these are uh, antibodies that are artificially made, which uh, attack uh, a few points of the spike protein of the virus. Dr. Abraham mentioned the spike protein. If you imagine the spike protein to be a mountain, there are a few rocks on the mountain that are targets of antibodies. Now, Omicron has changed a few rocks around. So, which means that the original antibodies that were created to hit these rocks are not working anymore. But the mountain is still the same, which means vaccines which are made to fight the whole mountain are continuing to work against severe disease. But these antibodies which are monoclonals are not working against Omicron. So the products that are available in India are no longer effective against Omicron. And the US FDA has already um, set out, uh, sent out a warning about that as well, that it is no longer effective. All other treatments are, are the same, pretty much the same. And our Ministry of Health and Family Welfare has put out evidence-based guidelines 
uh, having discarded all forms of treatments that are not effective. So the guidelines are available at the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare website and are divided into three categories, mild, moderate, and severe. And it's very clearly written. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, in this connection, um, let me also ask you that whether Omicron is really mild, as is being seen in most of the cases, is this a part of the available vaccines effective on Omicron? Dr. Jayadavan? The first question is very interesting, whether Omicron is mild. You know, in English language, some words cannot be used to accurately portray what it means in science. And that's a disconnect between literary, literary English use and clinical or scientific English use. Both are different. For example, I'll give you a, an, an everyday example. When a doctor says there is a risk of a, an event happening, the doctor means the odds or a chance of an event happening. But for the common man or the layperson, it means something very dangerous. So this, the word risk means different things in different settings. Likewise, when we say mild, it simply means that the overall profile of cases, if you take a large area or a large geographical area, yes, the overall impact is mild. And many individuals have no symptoms at all. And that was also observed in the first variant and also in the Delta variant. But the proportion of people with no symptoms at all is perhaps more for Omicron. And uh, if you talk to anyone who uh, was bedridden with Omicron, they will strongly disagree with the statement that it is a mild illness. In fact, they feel offended if you use that word mild. So I'll qualify the word mild as less severe. I think that is more scientifically apt uh, to use the word uh, less severe. Uh, in terms of whether vaccines work, definitely yes. In fact, if you look at all the data we are getting on the ground, experience of collective experience of doctors, uh, who are actively treating uh, the sickest of the sick uh, COVID-19 patients as of today, they will all tell you that the number of people uh, who are coming in who are ill are almost exclusively unvaccinated people or those who are not fully vaccinated. So that's one. And the second subgroup are really older and more frail people who by default are at greater risk for bad outcomes. So those two categories, yes, uh, uh, vaccines, they do work, but the overall impact of vaccines is that for Omicron, the first thing to remember is the variant itself is about loosely 20 times milder. I'll, give you, I'll tell you why I said that. There is a study out of Kaiser Permanente from Pasadena, California, that looked at a large number of individuals who were infected with Delta and with Omicron. And they found that the chance of a person being hospitalized after a Delta infection was one out of 50, five zero. With Omicron, it is one in 900. So by default, Omicron by itself is, a, is causing fewer uh, complications. And in, among those who got ill with Omicron in hospital, there is an approximately 70% reduction uh, by the paper published today in the New England Journal. It's a letter that came out of South Africa that looked at two-dose vaccination in South Africa and their impact on their hospitalizations. So anecdotally, experience on the ground says, yes, vaccines um, are effective against severe disease. But as Dr. Abraham said, vaccines are not, uh, not very effective against stopping infection because we are seeing people uh, who are previously vaccinated easily pick up the infection especially if they expose themselves to the possibility of picking up the virus by mingling with people in indoor settings. When we talk and when we eat together, that's when the virus spreads and uh, the virus makes no, uh, no mistake in uh, getting into a fully vaccinated individual. And that has also occurred overseas among uh, boosted individuals as well. There is an episode out of Faroe Islands near Denmark where 33 healthcare workers who were triple boosted with the Pfizer vaccine went for a party after testing negative. And 21 of them came down with what I described as rather severe symptoms that just did not require hospitalization. So which means that if you give the virus a chance, it will infect you. So the, our, the messages did not give the virus a chance to infect you. 
thank you doctor for the message do not give the virus a chance to to infect you thank you and let's not treat omicron as as mild rather let's call it less severe thank you uh, in this connection doctor um, let me ask you are reinfections and breakthrough breakthrough infections on the rise in this period of third surge well uh, from the moment this virus arrived on the planet it was clear to those of us who know about viruses that this comes from a family of viruses that is known for reinfections coronaviruses is a very large family a few of them infect man the rest of them hang around in bats among the ones that had been infecting man for decades we know that they can infect you anytime uh, within a few months to a, uh, a year and that's regardless of past infection which means that the virus is able to get past our immunity to infect us but they never caused a lot of complications the previous coronaviruses so this this uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus which is new to man over the last 2 years is starting to behave in the same fashion that is it is infecting people who have been previously infected and as dr abraham said also infecting people who been previously vaccinated so this is a uh, kind of a trait that respiratory viruses display not just the coronavirus there are several other viruses that cause repeated infections in fact there is one paper out which is very interesting which i'm sure our lay audience will appreciate that there was a study that looked at reinfecting volunteers with the same strain of influenza virus and within a year they they got they picked up reinfection which means that even the influenza virus um, even with the same strain it can cause reinfection so that is a trend we are observing uh, also with omicron particularly with its immune evasive nature and its fast spreading nature i'm sure dr priya abraham will be able to give us the um, the latest and the most up to date scientific updates on that topic Let, let's hear what uh, dr priya says uh, dr priya uh, dr abraham would you like to add something I think I think there's a yeah uh, I think I think there's a problem with the connectivity internet related yeah. okay. problem yes. or something like yes. that. Okay, but so for the most part these reinfections have been yes. mild. Um if you look at a profile of people who've been infected it's extremely uncommon to find a reinfection that was more severe uh, than the first. So reinfections on the one hand are um, are a nuisance uh, they're also a disappointment. for uh, many people who initially thought that you could get it once and it could be over with that's not the case with uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus and that is perhaps the biggest lesson that omicron taught us that um th- make no mistake uh, this virus is going to come at us again so that is uh, a realization that we must all have as i always say science is about truth it's the plain truth and sometimes truth may not be convenient for us but we just have to understand that i'll give you an example let's say you you slip and fall down and you know got a get a pain in your elbow we may want to believe that it is not a fracture but the science may tell us it's a fracture it's better to know that it is a fracture early and seek the treatment than to be in denial and say ah it is nothing so that is what science is about it's about knowing and acting accordingly okay thank you doctor uh, our next question is as it is being said that omicron variant is more transmissible so in this context are masks really effective that's a very interesting question now let me give the audience uh, our viewers a, an, an an easy example that they can relate to and then that will answer your question let's look at cholera cholera is a disease uh, which causes severe diarrhea severe dehydration it causes millions of deaths all around the world including in our country especially during the great famine that our country went through uh, many years ago cholera is not to be taken lightly but cholera was controlled not through antibiotics we have very effective antibiotics against cholera man conquered cholera by getting control of its environment cholera is a bacteria that spreads through unclean water or uh, through water that's been contaminated uh, with fecal material so when um, man was able to um, uh, to make clean water 
clean water available, clean drinking water, uh, which is mainly through chlorination, uh, the cholera went away. So the, so the, the lesson is, uh, even if you have very effective antibiotics, they are not going to stop a, a spread of a, of, a, of, a, of a pathogen in an area, in a large area. What is needed is something called public health measures. What I gave you is, an, is a simple example of a public health measure that can get rid of cholera, for example, and also say, for example, for malaria. You get rid of the mosquito, that's the way to get rid of uh, malaria because the mosquito carries the malarial parasite. Now let's come to SARS-CoV-2 virus or the COVID virus, if you will. COVID virus spreads through the air and our best bet to stop this pathogen from entering our nose and throat is to wear a mask. That's the reality of it. Whether it is convenient or not, it's a different story. This virus especially spreads in indoor spaces where people are having conversation. And conversation commonly happens during family reunions, when friends meet up, inside restaurants, or during business meetings, or du during festivities, uh, particularly when they happen in closed rooms. So um, when a person who's infected is talking, like I'm talking now, uh, if I'm infected, the virus will spread in the air around me and whoever is sharing the space with me will inhale the virus and get infected. And the way to prevent that is for me to wear a mask and for the other people to wear a mask while sharing indoor spaces. Now, that's extremely important. And while wearing masks, it's important not to leave a gap on the side of the mask. We all have different shaped uh, faces and noses and jaws. So we should find a mask that fits nicely, it's comfortable for us, it should be, we should be able to breathe and talk nicely while wearing it. And that is the best way to stop this virus from spreading, especially from indoor, in, indoor spaces. Now, I know it's not possible uh, or uh, practical and in every instance, but if we stay away from indoor gatherings, especially during a surge, that will also help. So it is not just the type of mask, but it's also the fit of the mask when we choose to wear it and when we remove it, those are situations uh, that will uh, decide on whether the virus spreads or not. For example, in a hospital, uh, you know, healthcare workers are getting infected. You know where they're getting infected? A common place where healthcare workers get infected is in the canteen, where they sit down, uh, let their hair down, take a few deep breaths, remove the mask and have a conversation with their friends while sharing a meal. And that's a common situation where this virus spreads. Again, it's inconvenient. So the solution there will be to sit at a separate table and eat alone. I know it sounds boring, but these are ways in which we must take it forward. Bottom line, masks are effective, particularly when we are around other people who could be carrying the virus without their knowledge. Thank you, doctor. I think um, Professor Abraham got disconnected for some issue, uh, so maybe internet related issues uh the next question doctor is um uh, tell us something about the post covid complications that may occur okay we have seen that um last year especially after the second surge so what sort of post covid complications are being seen now well the post covid complications, complications can occur in two formats uh if someone who's someone uh, who was in icu with severe lung damage uh, gets uh, survives the illness and goes home, yes, they could have uh, complications as a result of the organ damage that occurred uh, from COVID-19. Or someone who had a stroke or someone who had a heart attack as a result of COVID-19 could have complications afterwards. Now, that is not what we want to talk about. We want to talk about what is called post-COVID that occurs in the everyday infection that, that happens to uh, people who are at home, for example, or at work or some people who may not even know that they have the infection. In such cases, about 5% of cases, uh, some series may have may report bigger numbers, but that's controversial. But approximately 5% of individuals who pick up an infection of COVID-19 uh, develop uh, what is called long COVID-related symptoms. And they can be fatigue, tiredness. Some people have uh, breathing trouble when they go up the stairs, and that, ha that has commonly happened among younger people who were previously healthy, 
And then there are some individuals who can't concentrate. We call it brain fog, where they get, tend to get a little forgetful and they may forget names and they may not be able to focus on certain tasks and they feel tired. Some people get body aches. And uh, so, that, th th so these are some symptoms uh, which are called long COVID. Uh, so this, d this does occur in a sizable number of people. Um, and I might add that this is not a new problem for virus infections. You know, while even during uh, our doctor training days, there were a large number of people who we saw in our outpatient who we had no idea what was causing their fatigue. They were, these were young women, especially who would come from villages, who would come with severe aches and pains throughout the body. And if you investigate them, uh, nothing could be found. So it's quite possible that there, were, there are several viruses that are circulating in the community that after the infection, uh, many of them are leaving people with such ill-defined symptoms. But fortunately, these are not life-threatening symptoms. Uh, while some of these can be rather disabling, we are hoping that with time, our body has the ability to heal and uh, get rid of a lot of these. Uh, uh, you could, if people who are having these symptoms uh, must uh, perhaps take a visit, pay a visit to the doctor uh, and speak with the doctor uh, who has an interest in uh, treating such conditions and uh, also undergo investigations as directed in each individual case. Not every individual might need an investigation, but sometimes a conversation uh, will be reassured. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jayadevan. Uh, we have brought Professor Abraham back with us. So, Professor, <laughs> welcome <laughs> back once again. Uh, so, um, Professor Abraham, how important is it to take the precaution course of vaccine? So, I would like to put it in a very simple way. You know, um, when we think of our cricketers and sportsmen who go out onto the field to play their game, you'd see many of them have got a bit of sunscreen on them. And after their coffee break or whatever uh, uh, lunch break, they will dab on some more sunscreen on them simply because they want to prevent that sunburn and sometimes chronic exposure to the ultraviolet rays of the sun can actually lead to uh, skin cancer, especially in the lighter skinned individuals. So uh, a vaccination, the primary vaccination of the first and second dose, um, uh, which most of India, as was already mentioned, has received, is the initial dabbing of sunscreen because you anticipate that you're going to be exposed to a lot of sun. And then you're going to continue to play in the sun out there. And some of that sunscreen may have, you know, uh, melted away in the heat of the sun, may have been rubbed off accidentally. So you want to supplement that protection to your skin, which is being subjected to such harsh, uh, you know, rays of the sun. So the precautionary dose is, a, is akin to you dabbing on some more sunscreen, uh, you know, over the course of the day. Uh, the, it has definitely served to boost the immune system a little more to protect yourself from the more serious consequences of this infection. As has been said time and time again on the show, uh, Omicron, we have not been successful in preventing infection, but vaccination has very, very successfully served to prevent against the severe complications of this infection uh, individuals getting hospitalized, individuals having serious outcomes, and even the worst possible outcome of death. So that's the role of the precautionary dose, or what in other countries people would call the booster or the third dose of the vaccine. Thank you, Professor. That was a very beautiful analogy, uh, comparison of the vaccine with the sunscreen. Uh, and uh, there's a very important message Professor gave right now that vaccination has been very, very successful in pre preventing severe disease. So it is really very important. So, Professor, the next question is Would you like to tell us, uh, rather, would you, not a question, would you like to tell us something about the new diagnostic technologies that are coming up? Or that are coming up? 
um, you know, uh, all along through this pandemic, we were using what is known as a real-time PCR, what people call an RT-PCR. And uh, that, of course, is now, as I had earlier mentioned, being done in many, many laboratories in our country. But doing this RT-PCR does not serve to differentiate between, say, the Delta variant of concern, the earlier version variant of this virus, and the current Omicron. So for that, today, world over, scientists are trying to develop, uh, you know, variant Omicron-specific PCRs. So you, you tweak the RT-PCR by using specific primers and you can detect whether the Omicron is the culprit when you do an RT-PCR and you get positivity. Without this, you would actually have to do a regular RT-PCR and go on to sequence to find out whether the infecting strain is Omicron or de Delta. But the new innovations, as I just mentioned, is to have an Omicron-specific RT-PCR. Thank you, doctor. So we will be having Omicron specific RT-PCRs and then uh, will this be the last variant of concern or in other words, will COVID sort of end with this Omicron variant, come to an end, near its end, professor? So uh, it all depends on the stability of the strain. And so far, you know, I've said it's already got, you know, three cousins of which two are widely moving, uh, you know, circulating both in India and in other countries. And particularly the second one that emerged is very rampant. It's called the BA uh, point, BA.2, which is now very rampant in our country. So uh, in answer to your question, will this be the last? It all depends on what kind of stability the strain behaves. And it appears to us that it's not that stable. And it also depends on what newer strains appear and their behavior, the newer variants. So um, again, I would like to reiterate without uh, uh, not wanting to be too repetitive. We need to contain the spread of this virus. The more it infects new individuals, the more it will experiment with trying to make new variants, which becomes more adapted to the infected individual. And then we could see you know, newer variants coming to the horizon, uh, 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 you know, to our attention. So I would, uh, it's very difficult to say whether this is end game. We hope it is end game, but uh, we will have to wait and see. Thank you, Professor. Uh, but then what is the way forward with this uh, evolution of the virus? Okay, so what is the way forward? Is, okay, the yes. way forward is really to persist with the vaccination in any community, in any country, and to continue our COVID appropriate behavior, particularly the measures of wearing the mask and wearing it properly. How many of us have seen people wear the mask as a chin mask or just the nose out and the mouth covered? So wear the mask properly, number one. Number two, avoid uh, ill-ventilated places within a building or a, uh, a facility. Uh, 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 observe good hand hygiene and, of course, that physical distancing. So things really haven't changed if we want to control the spread of this virus. Proper mask wearing, the rest of the, uh, you know, um, um, COVID-appropriate behavior, and continuing to persist with our vaccination and also encouraging those who are eligible for the precautionary dose to take it as soon as possible. The future lies in how much we are able to contain the spread of this virus. And if we allow it to spread, it is anybody's guess which turn this virus will take in making new variants and how those variants are likely to behave. Thank you, Professor. Dr. Jadavan, would you like to add something to it? Dr. Abraham said that we must not allow this virus to spread. And we must not forget there are still um, a considerable number of people who are yet to receive vaccine in our country. And uh, particularly uh, people who are older, 
uh, are at substantially greater risk of bad outcomes and they must definitely come forward and take the vaccine, the primary series at least. And then uh, those who are particularly vulnerable must get what is called a precautionary dose, as uh, Dr. Abraham said. I would also add that uh, a particular, there are two particular subgroups I'd like to highlight. One is the immunosuppressed individuals, people who have compromised immune systems, either because of the nature of the disease or certain treatments that they require to be t uh, required to take. Both both of these categories of individuals, for instance, somebody who's had a kidney transplant, has chronic renal failure, somebody who's got um, HIV infection, uh, somebody who's got who's taking um, anti-cancer treatments, who are uh, which are uh, immunosuppressive. In these individuals, the virus gets a chance to live for an extraordinarily long um, amount of time. Specifically, if the virus, if the Omicron infects one individual now, uh, it does not last longer than 10 days. The actual infection may not last more than 10 days or two weeks in most cases. But in such individuals, it could live for as long as 100, 150 days. Uh, and uh, during that time, the virus gets all the time in the world to examine uh, the immune, immune response of the individual, specifically the antibodies, and then create mutations uh, that uh, are customized to the antibodies. So in a healthy individual, the virus does not get so much of a chance to study our immune response before we get rid of it. But in the immunocompromised, the virus gets all the time in the world. So these individuals... Uh, must definitely be vaccinated fully, preferably with three doses to the minimum. So that is one thing that I would add. And the second category are pregnant women and also women who are planning pregnancy because pregnancy uh, carries a substantial risk of bad outcomes with COVID-19. So uh, there, is, there is still a little bit of hesitancy uh, among pregnant women to get vaccinated. Uh, to the best of our knowledge, vaccines are safe in pregnancy. Uh, there are no reported bad outcomes as a result of vaccination in pregnancy. And uh, uh, that is one category that I would single out again uh, to highlight uh, for the vaccination process. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jayadevan. Uh, Professor Abraham, we know that NIV has played a pivotal role in the fight against the pandemic, uh, spearheading many researchers and handholding many other institutions in this research, in all the researches related to COVID going on in the country. So would you like to say something about the, about the um, uh, struggle of NIV, NIV and um, your scientific community uh, since the start of, start of the pandemic? Thank you very much for asking me that question because um, I think, uh, you know, looking back, the last two years has really drawn on every skill, every, uh, you know, bit of tenacity my colleagues needed to um, have to face up to the challenges and deliver. You very kindly mentioned our many achievements in uh, this institute. And this is only because of the excellent teamwork that I enjoyed in this institute. Now, uh, the challenges were that, uh, you know, even to send out 62 lakhs of RT-PCR reactions throughout the lockdown period of 2020, to pack it, to do a QC check, send it by the latest flight out of Pune or the first flight out of Pune, it needed tremendous teamwork. And to do those QC checks to, you know, put together a kit and send it out required uh, not just hands, but skilled hands. You know, people who are trained to handle reagents to, uh, to put in, to make up a RT-PCR kit. And even the time that we were putting, uh, you know, helping BBIL with the vaccine, as you know, we had given them the strain of the uh, virus. And then we did all the preclinical trials in our institute. When we were trying to move on from hamster experiments to uh, monkey experiments, I would uh, rather call them primates, non-human primates. We had to capture wild caught primates, of course, after getting all the necessary permissions. But during the lockdown, there were no primates 
around our cities and towns. They're all gone into the depths of the jungle because the lockdown was on. They had no food to feed on, which human beings would leave around. So our scientists had to travel deep, hundreds of kilometers into the depth of the jungle to capture these primates. So it was, you know, like out of a movie to send people, you know, in the dead of night, go get the, uh, you know, go with the forest officials into the depths of the uh, jungle to capture these primates and bring them back. And that required a lot of grit and tenacity for my colleagues. The other challenge we faced was the most of um, India had run out of reagents for RT-PCR. I don't know whether you know, the world over was facing a crunch. And that was when the Prime Minister's Atmanirbhar program uh, boosted us to do validation of several made in India kits. And we have, uh, you know, actually validated a few hundred of them. And because we could validate them, we were able to use even indigenous reagents to meet the demand that the pandemic, um, you know, required and posed on us in uh, 2020, 21, as well as it's going on in this year. So that's a, a very briefly, not so briefly perhaps, what NIV went through. And I we did went through a lot of struggle, a lot of lot of challenges, and um, we're still uh, spearheading, spearheading the uh, scientific researchers in the country. So obviously that cannot be said very briefly. Uh, I'm sure there is more to say on that. But um, let me also ask Dr. Jayadevan about. The, uh, about about what the medical community of the country is facing now uh, in uh, with respect to this COVID, third surge of COVID? Uh, it's a good question because the medical community uh, represents a very large group of people, uh, including people like uh, Dr. Fay Abraham uh, and people who are on the front lines and people who are Asha workers who are women, who are typically women, who are from the communities, who grow up in communities and they serve the communities and they serve all the health needs, uh, profoundly instrumental in the vaccination process and uh, uh, taking care of the daily queries that our citizens have. There's a large group of people. So if you ask me the, the challenges, uh, in the first a couple of waves there were unfortunately there were several deaths because you know we did not have vaccines in the first year so uh, a large number of people in fact succumbed in our country uh, while fighting uh, fighting the disease and also serving the community so that's one uh, we must really remember the names with uh, with great respect uh, I, i'm referring to all frontline and healthcare providers uh, who uh, were instrumental in that. In the second wave, after the vaccines were rolled out, our government uh, did, uh, did, did their planning so well in the sense that our public health decisions, I must, uh, I must add that our public health decisions have been spot on when, while compared to several other richer and wealthier and so-called developed nations, our decisions to um, prioritize the vaccines by age group and also by uh, category in terms of healthcare workers and frontline workers. So it, it turned out so well that by the time Delta wave hit, uh, it came around March and April, uh, April and May of last year. By then, most of our healthcare providers had received um, um, at least one dose of vaccine. And that greatly reduced the, the, the tragedies, the deaths that specifically occurred in that community. So they, that gave them a lot of confidence uh, in um, fighting uh, this pandemic and serving the country. So that's second. Uh, in the Omicron wave, what we are seeing, uh, to put it very briefly, is, um, is, is personnel shortage. That is, many people are falling ill. Uh, as uh, Mr. Desai said, uh, the family pack, he mentioned the word family pack. Yes, that is so true. Uh, the entire family is down because, you know, I... Uh, network with so many doctors from around the country and many of them have uh, contracted uh, Omicron infection along with the whole family. And so when such an individual is out of commission for seven days or 10 days, uh, naturally somebody else has to carry on the work. And uh, not all uh, cases uh, are 
uh, it is possible, you know, not all cases is it possible to have somebody to do the exact kind of work. So that uh, the, the shortage of personnel is the major issue that uh, healthcare personnel are facing this season, uh, specifically, specifically with Omicron. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, we have come to the with this. Uh, we have come to the end of the technical session. Now we'll take some questions that we have uh, received from the audience, uh, from the viewers, in the, in our YouTube live chat. So there's a question from um, there's a question from Miss Namrata Devikar. Uh, she wants to know the current about the current studies going on in India to identify new variants. What is the status of these studies and which institutes are conducting these researches in India? So, who would like to take that question? Yes, Professor. So, um, in answer to uh, Namrata's question, um, there are two kinds of studies that are happening. One, as I had mentioned earlier, the genomic surveillance. And today we have a, a, over 50 government laboratories that are participating in this genomic surveillance. We started with 10 labs and now we work in a hub and spoke model where each of the 10 labs are kind of, uh, you know, overseeing the other labs that have joined this network. And so genomic surveillance is happening via these 50 plus labs. The other uh, uh, studies which are uh, uh, being undertaken regarding these variants is to look actually in our country with our uh, isolations of Omicron in our country, is it really true that the, there is immune escape in individuals who've been vaccinated or exposed to the virus? Yes, we have done that. It's not yet published, but we are seeing, yes, Omicron is able to escape the, uh, you know, the neutralizing capacity of pre-existing antibodies, either following infection or vaccine. And uh, what has been, uh, you know, put out by other workers in other countries is, uh, you know, being born true even in our country. So we are monitoring actually in terms of how much of immune escape new variants um, uh, provide each time we come up with a new variant of concern. So that also is happening in our country and uh, definitely in this institute, in the ICMR National Institute of Virology, it's happening. There are a few other institutes like THSTI, uh, CCMB in Hyderabad, and uh, also in, um, um, I think, uh, another institute in Orissa. The few labs that are undertaking these studies with the live virus. So we have higher containment laboratories that can handle the live virus and do these tests. Thank you, Professor. Now, a question for Dr. Rajin Jayadevan. Uh, after completing home isolation, I think Dr. Jayadevan would like to take it. Uh, after completing home isolation, how should the room be cleaned or readied for regular use by other family members? Person, uh, that is of great practical relevance uh, to our viewers. Uh, that is, uh, after a person has recovered, how how do, how do we get that room back in commission for the rest of the home uh, to access? So uh, the first thing will be to change the uh, the bedding, that is the uh, sheet and the pillow covers, uh, to wash it in warm water. That will get rid of any um, virus that is lying around. The second is to remember to clean using a dilute form of bleach. Now, bleach is an inexpensive and most effective cleaning agent uh, against uh, most viruses, including this one. And uh, you can make a dilute uh, solution of bleach uh, by adding a little bit of uh, bleaching powder uh, into a litter of water, and then you can use it to clean the floor. And we must remember to let this solution dry on its own. Once we wipe the wipe the floor uh, with the cleaning solution, we must remember to make it let it dry naturally because only when we do that will chlorine uh, get to work on uh, the virus and, and destroy it. And the same can be done uh, for the toilet, uh, the toilet seat, and the floor uh, must be de uh, disinfected. Uh, metal surfaces uh, tend to get damaged with bleach, so you could use uh, basic soap to wash these 
uh, metal surfaces or a sanitizer can be used. Uh, there is no need to fumigate the room. Leaving the uh, doors and windows open is the best way to get rid of uh, aerosols that hang around in closed rooms. So those are some basic uh, precautions that one can use. There is no need to be so fearful about virus spreading from surfaces. I know that uh, the whole world was obsessed with cleaning of surfaces, repetitive cleaning of surfaces, which is really a little bit of an overkill. In fact, this virus, as I mentioned earlier, spreads through air rather than through surfaces. So I'm not implying that surfaces be left unclean, but there is no need to obsessively clean them, except perhaps for uh, frequently touched surfaces. For example, in a school, you'll want to clean the tabs that the children use. Uh, and uh, commonly touch surfaces like the staircase railings where a lot of people, a lot of children hang on to and, and so on. So there is really no need, uh, there's not much of a role for um, uh, surface cleaning as much as we pay attention to uh, keeping the air safe. Um, thank you, Doctor. Uh, there's another question uh, from the audience. Is steam inhalation helpful? Is an excessive use of steam dangerous. Uh, I think Dr. Jaidevan, would you like to answer it? Yeah, I will take that. Yeah, steam inhalation is a common home remedy for most uh, uh, upper respiratory infections like the common cold. Now, the, the problem with steam inhalation is a couple, uh, there are a couple of problems with it. See, if you take a tablet of paracetamol, uh, which is 650 milligrams, we know that every tablet contains 650 milligrams of paracetamol. So it is standardized. But steam is not a standardized commodity. One person uh, might decide to use a particular kind of steam in inhalation. Another person will use a different technique. So uh, excessive uh, steam use uh, has been documented. And uh, there have been cases of steam burns happening not only on the skin by spillage of boiling water, but also internal burns that uh, could occur in the delicate linings of a respiratory tract. Remember that our respiratory tract is such a delicate lining, which is not built to accommodate steam. We are, we, our bodies were not built to inhale steam. We must remember that. So uh, many people are under the um, mistaken impression that this virus is like dirt sitting on a wall that can be washed off like steam cleaning a carpet. No, our internal lining is not a carpet that can be cleaned using steam. Um, steam does not kill viruses uh, that are infecting the human body because the virus lives inside our cells and they don't they don't stick around like dirt on a wall, as I mentioned. So that, that is a mistaken concept. The second is some people have seen some WhatsApp videos that promote excessive steam inhalation. I've seen videos of people putting hose pipes into their mouths and taking large amount of steam and pushing it out through the nose. That is so dangerous because Steam causes worse burns than boiling water, if you remember the basic principles of physics. So I would discourage excessive use of steam. And to put it very simply, if you don't take steam, nothing will ha nothing wrong will happen. But uh, if you take steam inhalation in a very gentle fashion, it may give a little bit of symptomatic relief, but it's not going to take the virus away. Thank you, Doctor. Um, there's a question for Professor Abraham. Can someone get reinfected with Omicron variant BA 2.0 after recovering from variant BA 1.0? Uh, is described in the context of one having the infection once and in about 90 days, three months, you have infection with coronavirus again. So we are talking about BA.1, BA.2 that have been hardly here for three months, little less than three months uh, and uh, in our country. So uh, it would not strictly fall into, uh, though theoretically plausible, it will not fall into the definition of reinfection. And we must remember reinfection uh, has to be very carefully uh, you know, reported. Because when we do an RT-PCR, we are detecting the genome of the virus, not necessarily live replicating virus. And in some individuals, that RT-PCR positivity can be lingering on for a long period of time. 
So after a month or so, or after you know tw- uh, three weeks, people pick up an RT-PCR signal and say, oh, I've been reinfected. So we must use that uh, word very cautiously. And by the strict definition, which I mentioned, uh, it's too early for, that, for us to actually report a reinfection with BA.2 after a, a infe- a original infection with BA.1. But time will tell. Thank you, ma'am. With this, we have come to the end of the question and answer session, um, taking questions from the audience. Now I would request Sri Vinod Kumar, Joint Director of Press Information Bureau Goa, to deliver the vote of thanks. Thank you, Sri That was a very informative and explanatory webinar. To all the viewers, I'm assured that you have got a lot and your doubts clarified from this webinar. I, on behalf of my team members, Press Information Bureau, pass my warm gratitude to all my audience for the significant presence in this meeting. I especially want to thank our expert panel member, Dr. Rajiv Jayadevan and Professor Priya Abraham for their vital appearance and Director General PAB, Srinish Deshai sir, for organizing such a wonderful session and taking your valuable time to participate in our session. As Dr. Rajiv Jayadevan said, trying staying away from fake news and scary articles. Wishing you all the best. Thank you and see you again.